Hello, everybody, Happy. and welcome to this special event where Angular community meets Angular team. And today we're going to talk about standalone components, optional ng modules, incremental compilation, zoneless Angular, and all that <coughs> within one hour. So we have a very busy, busy schedule here. I'm your host, B-Man, but today is not about me. With me, my host is Lars. Lars, good to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for and helping organizing this. More than welcome. Uh, we're super happy to be part of this from the Angular Community Discord. And I'll do a, a, a debrief at the end for those of you that don't know where to find this. But um, for now, I'd like to ask Lars a little bit about context, how this came to be. And afterwards, uh, the guests can introduce themselves. And then we can move on quickly to the first point because we have a lot to discuss today. So Lars, if you could briefly tell a little bit about the context, that would be awesome. Yeah, so this, uh, I think it was about a month ago, there was an event called the Angular Contributor Days uh, organized by this.media and some other folks. And towards the end, there was like a, something like a free for all, like whatever you feel <laughs> is worth talking about. And we ended up discussing a lot of points. And um, I think it was st maybe Stephen Fluin who suggested that we could create some follow up events. Uh, where community members uh, and maybe someone from the Angular team like today uh, were able to join and discuss these topics. And uh, one of my favorite topics is optional ng modules and standalone components. So naturally, uh, I, I volunteered to organize this event and then I teamed up with you and, and uh, we were lucky to have some, some nice people join today. Awesome. Thanks a lot. Uh, so yeah, thanks for reaching out and thanks for, well, actually starting to organize this. Uh, Robert Willemis uh, from the Angular community is also very involved with the community, also helped organize this. So this is all super nice. Uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and have the guests introduce themselves and I'm going to go alphabetical order. So Alex, please. Hello, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Alex Rickabaugh. Uh, I'm a member of the Angular team. Uh, I've worked on a few different pieces of Angular, uh, HTTP client, service worker, uh, and currently I maintain the Angular compiler, and I'm working on the language service uh, for Ivy, so the, the new version of the language service that uses the Ivy compiler under the hood. Awesome. Thanks a lot for being here. Uh, Yoast, if I'm correct, with if my alphabet's still correct, Yoast will be the next one up. Yoast Kuhorn, nice to have right. you. Yeah, that would be me. So uh, I'm Joost, I'm from the Netherlands, and I contribute to Angular basically in my spare time. Uh, but I've been part of the team for, oh, I guess, about three, at least two years now, quite a bit. Um, I started working on NGCC when it came to be uh, two and a half years ago, and uh, together with Pete and Alex as well. Um, and since then, I've been contributing to the compiler mostly, and currently we're working on the, on the Angular linker also together with uh, with Pete. And I've been working a lot on the uh, compiler performance over the last year or so. So yeah, yeah. I think your your increase, uh, your decrease in my CI time is partly thanks to you optimizing. Uh, that might very well be uh, the case. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Thanks a lot for your contributions. Uh, so next one up <laughs> alphabetically and then also rounds up the Angular team. That would be Pete. Pete, nice to have you here. Thank you, Vim. Um, <clears throat> I was going. I'm glad that Joost mentioned the uh, optimizations he's been doing because both Alex and Joost are uh, overly modest people, and uh, they didn't introduce themselves with the, the kind of uh, exciting things as the, as I would have done. Um, they they both been doing some really incredible work on the compiler side of things. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, I've I'm also on the Angular team. I've been kicking around on it since like version 0.0. 10 and uh, seen plenty of iterations in the last couple of years I've been working a little bit more on the compiler side of things um, I've helped Yoast with NGCC and we're now working on the linker together I've done stuff to do with internationalization more recently with the, the uh, dollar localize toolkit and so on things like that and, uh, and I seem to get my hands dirty with things like documentation generation just to mix it up a bit Awesome. Well, thank you all very much for the contributions. Um, and this for now is the Angular team. We have a special guest, hopefully joining us uh, in half the hour. Uh, but for now, Sander, uh, Sander, I'm not sure why I pronounce it in English, Sander, 
Uh, if you could do a brief introduction and we'll bring on Michael as well. Hi, I'm Sandler. I'm an Angular GDE. Um, I'm working with Angular since version 0.8. Um, and I, I'm been with the team for a long time, alongside poking at them and fix this, fix this, fix this. And some of the things even got fixed. So I'm happy. Very cool. Thanks a lot for your contribution. Sander is also well known about Scully and he's a well seen member in the Angular community Discord. If you pop an issue there, you might very well have a PR up in your repo within like 30 minutes if Sander is around. So uh, that's all very much appreciated. And uh, so with us joined Michael Prentice as well. Michael, we're doing a round of introductions. So if you would kindly introduce yourself briefly and then we'll move on with incremental compilation. Uh, hello, Michael Prentice here. I'm on the Angular Components team, and I also do some consulting uh, outside of that. So working with a couple customers who have some pretty big apps and some challenges in this area. So I'm interested in the discussion. Awesome. And Michael is also famous about uh, growing the Latin American community in Angular. Angular.lat is his um, initiative. So that's also very cool to see in in these areas. So great. Uh, that was a quick introduction. I like this. So we can move on to the technical effort. And the topic is incremental compilation. Now I'm just a simple host. I'm just a simple engineer. I don't know very much about compilers and all that. I do use them a lot, or at least my code uses them. Um, but I'm not sure if somebody could give a brief intro about why this point is on the calendar and why this is here. And I think actually, Michael, this might be one of the things that you can address a little bit. Sure. Um, there's sort of a long history behind this. I think it goes back uh, a few major releases now. Um, we've we've got, um, you know, Ivy came along and, and you know, when, when, with Ivy came the need to really do like AOT compilation um, to get all the benefits you need. And, and, you know, as a consultant, I'm always working to get projects onto stricter and stricter, like build configurations and get all the benefits of that. But that also takes time to compute and to uh, run all of the actual compilations and everything that has to happen. So in, I think, nine or so, um, you know, we, we saw some slow down if you turned on AOT with Ivy. And so a lot of people for dev mode were using like JIT with Ivy um, just to get like a quick refresh. It would be a difference between like 25 and 35 seconds and, you know, six or eight seconds. Um, there were some big fixes for that in I think 11.1. So we made some real good, solid improvements. But then with Webpack 5 and some of the incremental compilation there, we took some steps backwards. Um, and so we sort of countered what we did to improve. And then there's been some work that's landed recently, I think in the latest 11, 1 to 11, 2, uh, we got some changes to sort of brought us to a better spot. Um, but there's also a PR out there right now that's uh, that Juice is working on. And there's a bunch of other stuff in this area where we're trying to get to a real good performant place for both rebuilds and production builds. Um, I think with Webpack's incremental compilation features now, we have a good path to get where we want to go. But right now, we've only sort of as far as I understand, we've only sort of enabled incremental, but we haven't done all the things to take advantage of that. So I think there's a lot of room for improvement there. And uh, what I'm being told is that, you know, optional NG modules and standalone components and things like that are on that path. And it's part of the recipe that we need. Cool. Thanks a lot for the introduction. I'm not sure if, if uh, anyone of the Angular team first wants to, to take a go and lighten a bit, maybe give a bit of context. Yeah, I can kind of take a stab. Um, so uh, just for anyone watching who's is not really in, involved in the compiler space, um, 
incremental compilation basically means a compilation that doesn't start from scratch. So, you know, if you run ng-build, ng-build is going to take the same amount of time no matter how many times you run it because each time you run it, it is essentially looking at the program for the first time and doing all of the work that it has to do to get to a final bundle. Um, incremental compilation is a mode that's supposed to make this a lot faster by retaining kind of state and information about the program that we've learned from one compilation to the next. So that's your ng-serve or your webpack watch mode or TypeScript itself has a watch mode. Um, this is a particular area of challenge for Angular. Um, so at the core of all of our compilations, the, all of the, you have the Webpack layer and the Angular layer, but at the very heart of it is TypeScript. Uh, and TypeScript has this really clean, nice property that no matter how many TypeScript files you have in your program, so you have you know user.ts and and you know admin.ts or group.ts or something like that. Um, if you are sitting in your IDE editing one of those files and you save changes to that file, and TypeScript has previously compiled your program, the only file that it has to recompile, the only file that it has to re-emit, is the one that you saved. So that's a really nice property. If you only change user.ts, then the only JavaScript file that TypeScript needs to be concerned about is user.js. So this is TypeScript kind of has incremental compilation built in. Yes, and at the language level, it's, it's very clean. They, they made one mistake with this, but that's uh, an edge case. Um, Angular does not have that luxury. Unfortunately, in Angular, we have these things called ng modules. Um, and ng modules and the components that they declare form this kind of a, an ecosystem where you have a component with a template, and that template has certain elements with attributes that match selectors. And those selectors are declared in other components. And so if you change the selector of a component, everything using that component has to be recompiled because you've now affected templates kind of in the rest of the application. And so our incremental compilations are much more challenging than TypeScript's because we don't have this nice property that the file that you changed is the file that we have to produce. Right. And do I so, understand correct? So we, we you, the, the thing you mentioned is a selector. So this is if you do a comp component by selector, which is like the classic way to render a component in another component. Is this different if we would use, like, for instance, imports? If you route to a component, is this a different thing because you're just importing a TypeScript file here? Or doesn't that really make a change? That would make things a, a little bit easier, yes. So there's there's really, in, in our incremental compilations, there are two kinds of um, dependencies that a, a file can have. So if you think about a, the, the the, the, all of the files in your program is being in a graph. And one file can have dependencies on the contents of another file. Like if you were using a component, you depend on its selector in your template. You can have dependencies that are imports. So that's, for example, I'm importing a component. I'm an ng module, right? I'm importing a component to put it in my declarations. That ng module has a hard dependency on the component being imported. And then you also have these kind of implicit or indirect dependencies, which happens through the selector matching. Right. And the former dependencies, the direct import dependencies, are much, much easier to deal with. OK, cool. So that's, that's an interesting uh, take on it. So it basically has to do with how we wire basically importing files together and knowing which files need to go where. And, and yeah. for TypeScript, that's way more straightforward because you'd always have an import export relationship between two things. So I think it would be useful to talk about the recent slowdown um, that happened in, um, in ng-serve and, and build times. And at the heart of all this is um, an optimization that Webpack is doing. So let me see, what's the best way to explain this? So Webpack is, is watching the files in your project. And Webpack is looking at those imports. And so whenever you change 
a file in your project. Webpack sees that, and it, it's you know invoking Angular compilation, and then it's trying to decide basically on its own right if you change user.ts, what files, what chunks need to be reproduced? What could have been affected by that change that, that is work that now needs to be redone? And Webpack is very, very good at this. But Webpack is using the import graph in order to do that optimization. And we discover that there is a bug here where Angular would be producing, you know, Angular is looking at this, this import graph, but it's also looking at the ng modules and the selectors. And so Angular knows, for example, that if you change a selector in a component, other components might be affected, where there's not necessarily an import path there. And so this was a change that was kind of invisible to Webpack. And so we fixed the bug in the CLI where now we tell Webpack, hey, in addition to the import stuff that you were doing, you also need to re-emit these other files. You also need to regenerate more chunks because you could have affected components that were using this via a selector path, not just via an import path. And so we made the CLI output more correct. Unfortunately, uh, the Angular compiler is actually not very smart about figuring out which files need to be re-emitted whenever you change something like a selector. Uh, in fact, we're, we were very, very conservative about this. So if you change a component file, we were re-emitting anything that was using that component file before, even if you just added a comment. Right. Because we, you know, our logic was based on what could have changed. And so these, these two features together, Angular being really conservative about re-emitting files and telling Webpack to go ahead and like repackage everything that the compiler emitted created this kind of um, worst case scenario where now Webpack suddenly had to do way more work um, to account for the fact that the compiler was being really conservative about its emits. Uh, and so this is where the kind of the root of that slowdown. Um, and I'll turn it over to Yoast actually to tell you about how we're fixing this because it's his genius idea. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thanks, thanks for putting it aside. And and so basically, we're doing way much more work than is needed actually, due to various reasons. Thanks a lot for yeah. this, this declaration. This is the 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 kind of crux of incremental doing incremental compilation is right. You have to ensure that no matter what optimization you do, you are correct. Right. Right. And so there's this trade off between what well, we can do more work to try to track more things to try to optimize better. But at some point that gets more expensive than actually just doing the work in the first place. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Yoast, feel free to, to fill in. Yeah, so we have been aware of basically this pessimistic approach of determining all of these dependencies um, for about one and a half years or so. Um, but improving the situation was kind of a hard problem um, because in the decorators that you can put on uh, your classes, for instance, uh, take, for example, a component decorator. The selector that you put there um, can be an import, can be imported from some other file. Um, so then when, when you change that other file, you will indirectly also affect the selector of that component. And that component might then end up being matched or no longer being matched in other components throughout your application, depending on your engine module graph. Um, and in our incremental compilations, we would therefore need some knowledge to be able to tell like components, the component that I have here has now been changed. At least I have a new component. Um, but we need to compare the selector that is currently used for that component. Uh, we need to compare that to basically the selector that was previously used for the component. Um, and there are some other stuff like the set of inputs and the set of outputs uh, also determine uh, whether some matches can occur based on the selector. Of course. Um, because all of these things would require emit of every other component that uses the director. Um, so the hardest part, or one of the harder parts, was uh, to be able to 
make these comparisons in the first place uh, because your program is basically uh, an opaque structure of individual source files and these individual source files contain all of your class declarations and stuff um, but if you change a file you go from uh, you have completely separate or disjunct class declarations so there's no primary way to match up the new one with the one from the old compilation and that's required in order for them to be compared. Um, so one of the things we are currently still working on, uh, it started out as a PR with 2000 lines and I think it has doubled by now due to all sorts of edge cases that we needed to, uh, to incorporate into that. Um, is where uh, we basically start out to record all of the, the class declarations by their unique path. So for instance, you have a certain source file, it has a file name. And if you export a class uh, at, the, at the root of the source file, which is what most people do at the, the top level, um, we basically take the name of that class and record that into a new sort of graph. And uh, the graph is uh, retained until the next compilation where we built, basically we built the whole graph from scratch. But at that point in time, we have two graphs with two sets of symbols describing all of your classes. And because the, these symbols have been organized in a way where we can, uh, we, where we have identified them in a way that we can uh, grab the, the symbol representing the same thing from the prior compilation. And by doing so, we can make this comparison. Um, there's all sorts of situations that you have to deal with uh, at that point because, um, for instance, uh, you feel uh, you feel lucky and you change an add component decorator on a certain class into an ng module. Why not? Um, and then we were to fetch the symbol information in the old compilation, and we would find, wait a second, I'm now an ng module, but there used to be a component. What does this mean? So those kinds of effects come into play then. Um, but yeah, that's all dealt with in the, in the comparison structure. So once we have made this comparison, we can then see like, well, basically nothing of interest changed to all of these symbols, which means that no, no, none of the implicit dependencies like Alex explained uh, uh, occur due to the selector. They are not affected, so we don't have to re-emit all of these stuff, uh, all of these source files. And that's a huge win for incremental compilations because making incremental compilations fast basically means that you have to do less work. Um, so avoiding the work of emitting source files is a huge deal <coughs> in making it faster. But I can imagine like at some point you have to do some work, at least comparison to prevent doing the, all the extra work, which is not free either, right? Yeah, so um, the, the way we did this previously was we had a single dependency graph. And the, the dependency graph tracked all of the dependencies across or between source files. And we would, so we would first uh, capture all of the direct imports into this graph. But then we would extend that source or that file dependency graph with all of the transitive module imports as well. And if you have a large NG module graph, it would actually make a lot of additional dependencies that it would re register into memory in this graph, which was actually kind of slow. And uh, doing it uh, symbol for symbol now with the, the dedicated symbol graph um, means that we no longer have to explicitly register all of the transitive aspects of the dependencies which saves a whole lot in both memory usage and uh, uh, the work of doing all of the registrations in the first place. Um, and the comparison is a one-to-one -one comparison, so it's relatively fast. So what I found is that it's actually cheaper still to do the comparisons. Awesome. That seems, at least that seems like a win. <laughs> Uh, we have a question here from one of the people on the chat, but uh, I first, Pete, I wanted to make sure if you have anything to add to the previous speakers, please go ahead. 
Uh, so uh, this area of incremental compilation is not is not one that I've been uh, involved in particularly. So I'm very happy to leave Joost and Alex to to uh, give the all of the answers to those questions. Perfect. I see that. Um, I see Lars has, yeah. has a question as well as in the uh, public chat. Lars has a question. How does all of this affect large scale Angular workspaces? Do you have benchmarks for this use case? Um, I do have a few. Um, so the tricky part with doing uh, profiling and benchmarking is to get a representable project. And most of these large projects are enterprise and they are hidden for us behind closed doors. So we can't actually test with any of these projects. Um, so there are a few open source uh, repositories, at least, um, which kind of uh, mimic a large application, but it's mimicked by basically taking one set of modules and duplicating that 100 times or something, and then you have a large application, but it's not really uh, a real world approximation of how actual project would look like. Um, and we see a lot of different performance characteristics, characteristics based on kind of the, uh, the engine module structure at least. Um, but one of these repos I've been using um, for testing with, um, we found that the regression in 11.1 .1, due to the CLI's correctness fix caused some compilations to go from like six seconds to uh, 50 seconds. So that was a, a very large uh, regression in terms of performance. Um, the CLI uh, was able to make some improvements because it turned out that Webpack was actually doing something quite inefficiently and we were able to work around that. And then we saw it drop from 50 seconds back to 20. So that was already a big improvement. And now with the, the, the symbol thing that we are working on, we can see it drop down, down uh, I think even less to less than six seconds, but around the same ball mark as it used to be. Um, provided that, of course, you do not change any uh, selectors or something like that, because at that point you would affect a whole lot more shortfalls. Cool. Thanks a lot, uh, Lars. Uh, I'm not sure if this answers your questions. We have the luxury of you being here and uh, able to chime in. Yeah, I was interested because I know NX uh, is is working with their own uh, incremental compilation builder. They're taking a, a different approach where they are uh, they're using buildable libraries. So each project is a compilation unit or scope of compilation. Yeah, actually, um, that is one of the best possible ways to speed up the build of a large application is to split it into multiple pieces and feed them to the compiler in um, smaller chunks. And that's just because what happens then is um, you kind of naturally split your application along the API boundaries that you know about, but the compiler does not. And so you're going to split your application in a way where like, OK, these things are probably not going to change that much. You know, This is my component library. And then these are my actual like UI components that I'm evolving on a daily basis. and then you're kind of crystallizing those relationships into the input to the compiler. And so it knows, for example, like your, you know, your DTS files from your, um, your component library aren't changing. So it doesn't have to redo any work about that. Um, so that the, like the reactions that the compiler has to do to files changing get a lot smaller because the graph is just much smaller. They did stick to the solution style TypeScript configuration. Is that yeah. coming back to Angular as well? Um, I don't think that I don't think that it's going to come back in the CLI. Um, it's it's not really related to the uh, Angular compiler in itself. Um, it's more to do with how you package together multiple projects in a single workspace, um, and the the workspace TS config setup was really to help IDEs that were trying to understand the different configurations within a single um, folder structure. And this the CLI found that it just undermined performance for the, for the way that it works. Um, I was going to say, though, with regards to breaking your projects up into libraries, 
if you change something in a library which undermine which changes its DTS file, then everything's out the window, right? And every every downstream library or application that relies upon that library will be completely rebuilt. So you do have to be careful how you do split libraries if you're going to take this approach, um, because once DTS changes, then incremental builds are pretty much wiped out. I uh, think in I, yeah, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say in in the project that I'm working on, we've started this process. We're splitting out. We've we've got 70, 80 libraries split out now. But the problem is, anytime we try to build one, it says we need to build 61 other libraries to be able to build this because there's dependencies and circular dependencies, and there's just this whole web that has to be unwound before you can really take advantage of this. I think in um, in um, NX workspace, there's actually also implicit dependencies on things like your package JSON because that also might affect how your compilation is done. So if you change your package JSON, you might install another version of the library, which means you need to rerun the whole thing. So I think there's always going to be more things than just the source code itself that going to affect how these compilations work. Absolutely. And we have edge cases around like, what if you change the compiler options, you know, like right. are you changing the template type checking configuration or output configuration or things like that. Yeah. Um, how incremental can we be? Uh, I also want to make sure we get to the, the question from the community. Um, yeah. How does the incremental compilation work with a shared module? Uh, currently, I think the shared module is the worst case scenario for the, the current kind of regression slash bug, um, which means you have all of your components together in one pot, basically, and they all have visibility of each other. And because of that, the compiler currently is really pessimistic about its um, emit decisions. So it basically says, anytime you change one of those, we're going to re-emit basically the whole application. So it essentially wipes out the incrementality of the um, of the compiler wholesale. Um, but after Yoast changes with the uh, the semantic dependency graph, uh, it should be back to normal. Where if you're not changing the public API of those components, it'll behave basically the same way whether you have them in a shared module or not. Yeah, and even if you do change like the selector of a component, uh, which was only used in a single single other uh, component within that shared module, then you're not going to wipe out all of the decorations in the entry module, but just the usages. So um, yeah, it's, uh, it, it should offer a lot uh, of uh, uh, improved incremental performance. Uh, Awesome. I'm not the type of guy that usually asks for deadlines, so don't feel at all that this is an official thing, but the, the big PR that's in the run, that's still being worked on actively, any idea so where we can see it's, it? It's, it's a funny story. So uh, we started discussing uh, the idea of having this semantic depth graph about a month ago um, to see what ways we needed to, to, uh, to move to move it forward. And um, I have been spending the last couple of uh, weekends on it and was hoping to get it in like two weeks ago and then uh, just before the weekend Alex and I were discussing and we mentioned oh but this can break now so that weekend I fixed the one and then a week later I thought oh it's it's good to go now and then oh but it completely uh, uh, breaks all of our uh, template type checking generation code for instance so then I had to fix that um, and I think that was the last hurdle. Um, so hopefully, uh, sometime uh, in the in the near release, uh, it should be able to make it in. Awesome. Last last hurdle up until the next one, basically. Yeah, exactly. It seems. Yeah, awesome. It's, it's actually also fixing a few bugs. So uh, because now that we are thinking all of these edge case scenarios uh, through, we actually get to fix some of those were broken already. So. Uh, awesome. Cool. Super interesting. I guess the good news is that uh, it can it, it's going to be releasable in a patch version. So it's not that we'll have to try and get it out in V12 or something. It's it can right. come whenever it's ready. Small enough to be non-breaking when done right. I want to mention also uh, we have the semantic dependency graph changes in flight. Yoast also has a completely separate performance optimization that he's been working on in the compiler which also is hitting like massively in the benchmarks, um, big improvements. 
especially for large applications related to the way we resolve module paths when we're doing um, a phase of our compilation to try to detect circular dependencies. It's pretty crazy, like a little quirk that the compiler has to deal with. Um, but it's traditionally been something that we've known as is, is fairly slow. And Yoast decided to look at it and come up with a really like clever way of just optimizing away all of the slowness. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. yeah, which was an even bigger. Uh, this is a good example of how you need uh, proper reproductions to look at these scenarios, because all of the uh, tests that I have been working with, the optimization that Alex just mentioned was just like half a second or maybe a second. And then two weeks ago, someone reported a reproduction from his Windows machine, and that might be relevant, where it was 15 seconds. So, and I had never seen such figures, so it was ne really never that important to look at that particular problem uh, until someone comes along like, oh, I have this situation, it takes 15 seconds for me to do this uh, work. And actually that work needed to be repeated all over in each incremental compilation. Right. Um, and then indeed the improvement that I was uh, able to find uh, completely wiped away all of the 15 seconds to basically nothing. Awesome. Uh, yeah, so um, I'd love to wrap this up for now. I think I agree totally with uh, Shivam, who asked the other question, the future looks bright. Thank you. I'm, I'm definitely agreeing. I can also very much imagine that these kind of things are kind of like black boxes. And while they work well, you're not going to touch them just for the fun of it. But once you start digging into it and find where you can actually optimize, you might find a whole box of things that you never even considered before. So I can imagine that these are one of these these situations here yeah also uh, to the credit of the angular team uh, the typescript compiler has gotten slower over the versions they are doing more and more strict things and they are getting more strict and strict but they're also getting slower i have projects that are compiling 20 seconds only on typescript and it has something to do with types but it is really hard to find what is causing this slowdown and I hope the Angular team has some tips on that, how to find broken types, because that's mostly it. I would, before, I would act before he answers that, I just want to say it's worth noting that if you look through the commit logs for the TypeScript compiler, there are some performance improvements that Yoast has provided in the last year for them as well. <laughs> so he's not just he's not just built uh, improving Angular; he does TypeScript too. That's yeah, it was actually source maps is linked in my comment there about what had to change in 4.1. Yeah. But yeah, also I was, I was say that we have, um, you know, we've, we've hit a few of these cases ourselves because our template type checking has gotten a lot better. Um, and the reason that's happened is we generate TypeScript code to check templates, and we've gotten more clever about how we generate that code. Um, and in a few cases, we've actually hit some of these like crazy performance regressions in TypeScript, where we generate something that happens to be the pathological case. Um, and a, a lot of those fixes that Yoast have done started out as, gee, why is template type checking really slow in this case? And turn into deep dives into the TypeScript compiler internals. That's pretty awesome. Super nice side effects. And it's very cool that other projects outside of Angular get to uh, benefit from these kind of findings as well. So. Super nice. So if that's if that's all for incremental compilation, I think we have a, a way better idea of what the challenges here are. And um, looks like this is going to be addressed fairly soon, but no ETAs. Um, so standalone components. I think this is something that's uh, pretty interesting. It kind of ties in with optional modules, but we're going to separate them out. Um, and I'm curious who can do a little bit introduction to standalone components. What do we want to... What do we what do we mean with this? And somebody who who feels uh, informed enough, go ahead. I have a lot to say, <laughs> if if no one else. Lars, feel free. Yeah. So the idea about standalone components is that the component well, it also ties into the compilation, right? That the compilation or the compiler can have the local uh, compilation scope so that the component is aware of it on its own uh, declarable dependencies uh, so that you don't need an angular module so basically seems like you need optional angular modules to get standalone components 
uh, which and and Angular modules, as we know, are also tied into a lot of other uh, aspects of the Angular framework. So, um, yeah, so standalone components. It's not only about the modules. Is like it's also about modules. Also tie into bootstrapping, testing, lazy loading, routing, dependency injection, um, the public API of publishable libraries, workspace libraries, compilation schema, style, style compilation, and even Angular elements. Uh, so, so basically, it's an enabler for, for standalone components, but also other things, and they're all related. So I, I think uh, the Angular team needs to crack this nut for across the whole frame, framework before we can see something like standalone components, which would mean that we could lazy load a, a component and that component could even use other child uh, components as we're used to. You can you could even route directly to a component without an, an Angular module. Right, so that's, this is kind of the desired end state, right? So we, that we no longer need modules to wire it all up, but merely we can just use Components, I think, like from seeing at the Angular community, it's probably the, the most confusing part about Angular. Uh, when coming from other similar frameworks, let's say Vue and React, probably the easiest ones to compare with. Um, I think, I don't know Vue very well. I worked with React quite a bit, but Vue, I know with Vue, you have to basically register it in a different spot. So it's kind of a similar thing, but a different place where you register. Super curious to hear what the Angular themes, what your thoughts about this are. and. Uh, yeah, any input here is uh, super welcome. I just thought I'd say, uh, from a historical point of view, interestingly, just before Angular 2 was released, V2, uh, we didn't have ng modules. And directives and components really did have to have uh, their dependencies wired, hardwired into them. Um, but the decision was made that this made it hugely verbose and difficult to actually put together systems because you were constantly having to bring in imports, especially all the common ones, you know, things like ngif, ng4, and so on. Um, so ng modules was actually uh, a device that was created just before v2 was released uh, to allow people to group things together, to think of them as, as larger chunks. And so you would just bring in an ng module, and that would give your, your template access to uh, a range of directives and components in a single in a single swoop, um, and it seemed like a really good idea at the time because it's it saved you having to think about each individual component individually. Um, but obviously, as things have grown and applications that use Angular have grown, uh, we've started to see some some of the downsides of ng modules. Apart from the obvious one that you mentioned already, which is it adds another level of complexity and conceptual. Things that you have to learn when you're when you're getting to know Angular. Yeah. So that's the kind of background to ng modules. Yeah. So there was a, there was an Angular at before it was released 2.0. There was an Angular that didn't have it, but it was more verbose than what we what we have right now. And and honestly, way I also, more verbose. Way more verbose. Okay. And I teach <laughs> Angular as well to newcomers. To newcomers, it's way easier to explain because they have no frame of reference. So you basically can explain them how this kind of works. And I, it's like, this world is where this lives, and this world is where this lives. And you can get around this, but I think f specifically for people with more experience, they're like, why do I need, this, need to do this thing? And maybe even, can, can the compiler do this? And uh, I'm not sure if there's, if there's a, a link here with doing uh, how we go through the app with incre uh, incremental compilation. Is this something we can improve on, how this works behind the scenes? Getting rid of, of ng modules, like having having compiling an application that, that didn't have this kind of indirection associated with ng modules would make incremental compilation a whole lot easier, uh, definitely. Right. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, so we, I, I, from a, a technical standpoint, here is the the kind of real challenge we have with ng modules, um, and you know. They're hard to explain, certainly. Um, they do two jobs, which is kind of crazy, I think, uh, because they're both declaring like the, the structure and, and scope of a template. So they're declaring what directives or components are visible in the templates of the things that the components that they're referencing. But they also have this whole other like provider side that's related to them. 
um, for setting up application providers. And the fact that one one entity is doing these two jobs uh, with very independent life cycles is, I think, the most confusing part about them. Um, but from a, a technical standpoint, the problem with ng modules is that they get the dependency arrow in the wrong direction. So you have a component, and your component has dependencies. It wants to use material button. Uh, it wants to use other UI components in your application. And in any other JavaScript system, and as assumed by all other JavaScript tooling, such as optimizers, such as uh, tree shakers, webpack, et cetera, um, when you depend on something, you have an import to it. You have a direct reference to it. But that's not actually the case when you have ng modules. When you have ng modules, the ng module that imports the component and then pushes a bunch of state into the component, saying, you know, here's you know, here's all the, the different components that satisfy your dependencies. Uh, and so that has made kind of optimizing Angular a real challenge, like making it work well with all of the rest of the, the tooling in the ecosystem. And that's also at the heart of the incremental build problems, right? Because you have this arrow that's going in the wrong direction that you're then having to like um, unravel the effects of within the compiler. And so the, the Ivy compiler actually reverses this arrow. One of the, the big things, big um, design changes in Ivy is that we write into each component the exactly the directives and pipes that it's using. And so once your component is compiled with Ivy, it's as if you wrote those declarations literally yourself, if you declared all of your dependencies, just like in Angular before ng modules. And that allows Ivy to work really well with the rest of the tooling. Awesome. So Ivy is a step in the way to a future where you don't need ng modules anymore. It, am I correct that the provided in root option that the injectable has is a similar effort? Like, oh, we can do this in a different way. I think provided in root prevented me from the, from using providers almost altogether, bar a few edge cases. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we definitely, I think, tree shakeable providers, as we call them, um, right. are the way forward. Um, there should be very few cases where you need to configure and providers in an ng module. And we've like one of one of the options in the future is to have a different way of configuring the injection side, the dependency injection side of the application, than using ng modules. Uh, and Ivy kind of already starts to do this a little bit as well. So if you look at the compiled output of an ng module, um, the, it's two identities as kind of component scoping and as dependency injection configuration are separated. So ng module the decorator creates an output class that has two separate um, properties on it that deal with, with these halves. And you could imagine a world where there's another decorator that you would use that just does one of those jobs. Right. And I think at some at some event, I can't recall what, I think Rob Wormold was a person that created a new, uh, imagined a new decorator for the component where you basically pass them in, in that decorator. Uh, is that something that's that's feasible or is this something that's really far from where we are today? I've actually really been wanting to build a prototype of it. Um. <laughs> Why not come yeah, on my so live stream and, and do it there? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think it's definitely feasible. And one of the, the, the main challenge is just getting the API right because we need to hit that sweet spot between like way too much configuration for a component and you know creating concepts like ng module. Um, one of the things that I love to bring up as an example of this is uh, a directive in Angular called the default control value accessor, uh, which is part of the forms and reactive forms ecosystem. And so this is a directive that gets automatically applied to input elements in your template whenever you use the forms module. And most people who use Angular have no idea this directive actually exists. Because one of the benefits of ng modules is it allows you to hide implementation details of the libraries that you build. Yeah. So when you think of forms module, right, you think of ng model, you think of, of you know, form group and form array. You don't think of the way the control value accessor directive gets applied to the elements in your template. You never had to import it as a dependency. 
Yeah. Uh, the ng module just kind of makes sure that it's it's there, and so we need to retain that ability to have kind of private implementation details, uh, and still allow you to kind of specify things directly on the component. So, I I'm a huge fan of the um, the scam pattern, the single component Angular module, where you have one ng module per component, and I like to think of a world where essentially the component is is its own module so it can have dependencies on other components it can have dependencies on other ng modules if you're using a like forms module um, and you have an ecosystem where you don't necessarily have no ng modules but you have the ability to kind of declare an ng module in a much more intuitive way as part of a component itself very interesting that's me speculating on, on what the future is. <laughs> I can also imagine that it's for a library author, there's there's other rules or other things relevant. I think it's it's not as big of an issue to to basically expect library authors to provide an all-in-one package people can import and just hide away anything you have. But then in your app where you actually want to use it, you can just be as lean as you want. Yeah, Very interesting. Exactly. Anyone else likes to chime in here, likes to discuss some of these areas, optional modules, or standalone components? So it was um, actually Minko created a PR uh, more than two years ago, just when he joined the Angular team. And he has that he has had this proposal about the depths property directly on the component, which was able to import declarable dependencies and even Angular modules. And this was this seemed like the same proposal that um, Rob Wormald uh, introduced or discussed at NGConf 2019. Uh, is that, are you still looking in that direction? Uh, I was helping Minko with that, uh, with the, the work that he was doing. And yeah, so that was basically trying to explore the API space and figure out what that, um, what the right way to, to accept dependencies is for a component. Right. I think one of the uh, approaches in that PR is that you list the directive and component classes themselves, and there's no like uh, an ng module uh, envelope import. So the example that Alex just mentioned with the control value accessor would then have to be explicitly imported for you to be to use it in the template, which would be a huge uh, well would take away a lot of the the nice. Uh, uh, factors of how this forms API, for instance, is designed. Yeah, yeah, you lose kind of a, a layer of abstraction there, so you make your users have to deal with with implementation details, which I don't think is a good thing. Yeah. What, yeah, what so about the? Sorry, Demon. Go ahead. What about the render component function? Is that still in any plans or exploration? Ah, so. so Maybe Render you can briefly component. touch on what it is yeah. for those not aware. <laughs> um, sure. So render component is a function that um, astute developers may have noticed appear in the private API that's exported by Angular Core. Um, and it's essentially an alternative to bootstrapping through the uh, platform browser bootstrap, um, bootstrap module or bootstrap module factory. And what render component does is essentially take a single Angular component and attach it to a host element independently of ng modules. Um, so this function is part of a, a kind of technical experiment as we were developing Ivy to see how small can we really make the core rendering aspect of Angular. Um, from a, a bundle size standpoint, like what what's absolutely essential to rendering a component, and what is it, what can we have the tree shaker remove for us? Uh, and so, render component does not use ng modules. Um, it does not itself create an injector, although you can definitely pass in an injector to use as, as kind of a root. Um, and it also does not use zone.js. So the change detection for render component is done using um, a couple of other functions, mark dirty and detect changes. Um, and so this allowed us to basically get as small of an Angular application as we possibly could. And, and just 
a little bit of a, a look into the future of you know what might be possible. Very cool. So render components for now is going to be there as a part of this effort into getting a yes, simple yeah. Angular. I think you'll you'll see it continue to evolve as a private API. I don't think the way it looks now is is its final form. Um, there's some other questions to be answered there around you know okay, how do you do change detection in a zoneless application or or right? But what I really think is is you'll end up with an Angular that allows for using zones or not using zones, and an Angular that allows for um, using ng modules or not using ng modules. And those will be kind of independent decisions that you make as a developer. Right. Would it be possible to do hybrid? So a mix of no modules and modules? Yeah, I think that's that's absolutely feasible. As far as like the, the mental model of Angular goes, as long as you know what the dependencies are for a component, you can compile it. And so whether you provide those dependencies kind of directly as directives or through an ng module kind of indirection, I think it, it makes no difference to the, the final result. Yeah, I think for library autos, it would be very interesting to have something like um, an injector scope so you can create your own multi module module, you model yeah. light. So you can put in the directive, the form directive thing, and a couple of things you need for your other stuff to work without putting that burden on the library user. So Lars, so. Lars touched on lazy loading too, um, which, which kind of highlights this, this challenge. So um, in Ivy, you can lazy load a component independently of its module. You can use import, you can grab a reference to the component, you can use any um, component factory resolver to get the, the kind of factory you need and render that component. Where that breaks down is if your component is part of an ng module and makes assumptions that the providers in that ng module are going to be available to it. And so that's where you actually have to like load the ng module separately, create an injector for it, and then um, render your component in the context of that injector. And that's something the router has already done for you. Um, but this just it's the reason this is so confusing to people is that the ng module both declares the component and the providers and so it kind of looks like this is one thing but it's really not you once the component is compiled it's separate from that ng module it's it, it lives entirely on its own it already knows its own dependencies it can be lazy loaded independently um but it doesn't benefit from the providers that are in the ng module right you have to kind of orchestrate that yourself I just wanted to mention that on, you know, there's, we had the topic of hybrid, um, ng modules, no ng modules. And then the other question is like, can I have hybrid zone JS applications where I have zones and part of my application, but not part of my application. And so for people watching this, I, I think we can, there's ways to do that today. Um, a lot of really big applications are already implementing um, these sorts of things. And so um, if you do a little more research or comment in the, the thread we have on GitHub, uh, we can point you to some you know, guidance there so you can start to do that if you are having some sort of performance or change detection issues with Zone. There are ways to disable it for parts of your application. I think this kind of ties in uh, neatly with one of the questions Chow makes in the comments here, which is right now there's a zoneless initiative by the RX Angular team. Michael Latke is the one that is uh, doing this. Is the Angular team aware of this? Well, I cannot imagine you're not being aware, but uh, or spend time to explore RX Angular or any future initiatives. I think um, that this is probably um, a whole episode in itself. <laughs> and I know that uh, Mishko was keen to uh, be involved in, in discussions to do with uh, Zoneless. And so rather than trying to answer that now, I think perhaps what we should do is try and arrange to have another call where, uh, where we can talk about the various 
potential for zoneless from the framework and obviously tie that in with the various other initiatives that are going on outside of the, uh, the core framework as well. Not that I want to sidestep the question or anything, but uh, it, it is a pretty big area. I love that suggestion and I'm more than happy to host this. I'm sure Lars will be the same. So let's, let's put that on the calendar. Maybe somebody can briefly touch on this thing without going into too much detail. I assume you're aware of this, I just right? I want to mention uh, Michael Latke is actually hosting the Reactive Angular events that also came from the same initiative as this one. So that would be a good forum. He, he's, he seems to be wanting to schedule them uh, monthly. So maybe we should get in touch with him. Yeah. Yeah. And if, if you like, Beeman, I can give a, a quick answer there. Um, so the way we think about Zoneless on the team is that it's the framework's job to provide some kind of um, primitive, like if, if zones are not driving change detection, then something has to drive change detection. And I think it makes more sense for us to provide the primitive there, uh, which the render component API is, is kind of a good example of this because it has a, a mark dirty function, which is like an explicit call you make to Angular to say like my component has state change and needs to be change detected and then a detect changes function that it schedules to happen on the next animation frame. Um, I think it, it is up to us to provide the primitive, but from a user experience standpoint, nobody would want to write an application and make explicit calls to Mark Dirty. Instead, you probably want to use a state management system of some kind, be it NGRX or RxAngular or, or something else that is provided as a library that wraps that primitive. And so I think that's where you'll you'll see the, the zoneless effort kind of converge um, on the framework providing kind of the bare bones minimum API and then working with uh, teams like RX Angular to integrate that into something that makes sense as an offering to users. Very interesting, yeah. Yeah, but you're, you're definitely aware and, and uh, up to date with, with what's happening there. And uh, yeah, I personally never really thought uh, Zone.js, I can't remember. So I I don't really feel thing. I think I just developed two simple apps for that to, to need to happen. Uh, but awesome. Um, I'm not sure, we're, we're at the hour. I have all the time. I got the whole afternoon free. I'm not sure how anybody else is doing. If you have to drop off, feel free. And otherwise we might uh, move on a little bit more. Uh, I think there are some questions in the comments uh, that we might want to touch on. Yeah, I'm happy to stick around for a little bit. Uh, let me let me quickly see. So, Chow here. I, I don't know if I fully... One question about standalone components. Since Ivy came out, there's been a way to use standalone components with dynamic imports. So this is where Alex briefly touched on already. Is this still the way to go? And then there's a related question. I might as well throw it in right away so we can give an, a, a one full answer. In a related standalone question, component question, I remember Stephen mentioning that the dynamic import syntax isn't standard, or there were still different ways to use standalone components at the moment. So, standalone components in Ivy, what's 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 the deal with it? I think that's the the way to summarize these questions. Yes. Yeah, so the 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 way in Ivy of imp of importing a standalone component is currently the way to go. Uh, I think you will see this get a little simpler over time. Um, right now, there's kind of one hoop that you have to jump through, which as Lars just mentioned here, is, is uh, needing the component factory resolver. Um, that is, is kind of an API quirk related to how Vue Engine used to do um, component rendering, where it needed a factory and not the component instance itself. Um, and yeah, I think we'll we'll be able to make that disappear once um, once we no longer need to support Vue Engine. I think that's a very interesting point, and I'm actually amazed that we're into more an hour and we didn't hear Vue Engine one once before in this session, or I didn't hear it. So that's kind of cool. Um, so I'm curious to know how many of the things we discussed today are still related to Vue Engine being in there, and if this is something that will magically resolve a bunch of things uh, that we're working against, that's working against us basically right now. I don't think very much. Um, certainly in terms of, of API direction, 
um, we're limited in, in being able to make changes to Angular's APIs around things like ng-module or component decorator um, that would need to be backwards compatible with, with the view engine opt-out that we currently have. Um, but I don't think any of these discussions are at the point where we would start making those changes anyway. So it's not been in, been holding us back. Our, our focus as a team has kind of been on, on getting to the point where we can remove view engine entirely. Um, and at that point, we'll start looking at, okay, now that we don't need backwards compatibility, what kinds of, of improvements can we make? I heard a big company in Mountain View still uses some view engine here and there. So uh, they might have to upgrade first. <laughs> Um, so okay, less but it's, less. it's less and less. So that's that's good. No, I can totally imagine. And with that amount of apps, uh, yeah, it's always the question if it's worth the effort during the upgrade or sticking around. So I I, I think most developers can totally relate with uh, how complicated it is. So so super interesting. But it's also good to hear. I think that it's not uh, limiting the flexibility we have today. So it's more like okay, we need to take into account. We need to remain backwards compatible but it's not something that will magically uh, make all these things disappear once uh, view engine support is out there. Uh, so that's cool. I think we touched most of the topics in the list today. Lars, I'm not sure if you have anything uh, that you think we should touch on or if there's any uh, questions we can just pick up and drop in. Uh, a lot of questions are already asked by the other people in the chat, which is great. Thank you so much for your support there. Um, and if not, I'm open to have a little uh, like thing of idea. If you want to share anything, if you want to plug something, areas to look at, PRs to check out, anything can go. Um, Lars, if you don't have any any points. Yeah. About optional NG modules, is it something you've begun looking into actively again? And which challenges are, are you facing from the top of your mind? So I think like. Here's, here's where we need to clarify the difference between optional NG modules and standalone components. Um, do you mean being able to build an application that doesn't use NG modules at all? Or do you mean being able to write a component that doesn't need an NG module in order to work? Uh, yeah, like the whole, I'm, I'm always thinking about the whole application, every aspect all application. of NG modules. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we've, we're, we're particularly far along on that front. Uh, I think for the foreseeable future, you'll see applications bootstrapped with ng modules. Um, because currently, that's the way our, our, our DI setup works. Um, and our, our bootstrap APIs are kind of centered around having an ng module kind of be the, the, the spark that kicks off the application. Um, yeah, being able to, I think you'll, you'll see first being able to create a component that doesn't need an NG module, and then down the road, possibly being able to create an app that doesn't need NG modules at all. Is there a prioritized item yet for the breaking apart DI and module management, those two concerns and separating that? I think that's probably just going to be a natural outcome of the, the optional engine modules project. Okay. That's on our, our roadmap currently. So optional NG modules also is, is meaning changing how some providers work and how dependency injection works. Okay. That's yeah. And I, I think that side of it is, is kind of less, um, is more speculative at the moment. Right. Like components okay. accept providers, right? Does it does that work for most applications, or do we need to have some other, um, you know, some other mechanism there? If you are providing a library, you need some place where you can hook in your dependencies that are really, really, really needed, and have a way to optionally hook in like optional dependencies. Yeah, uh, that is like a module light, the token thing, something, but you need to tell the dependency injector, hey, we have these things available. And I don't know, I think you can directly put a token in the directory in the injection tree and put everything on there. Simply said, there is a little bit more technical to it, but 
that would be, I think, the simplest way forward, but you first need to split it out from the modules. I think. Awesome. So thank you all so much for, for being here today and, uh, and enlightening us. This was super interesting, um, an educational session, at least for me. I learned a ton of things I have no clue about. I never needed to touch, so that's good. I want to do a brief round, uh, going alphabetical order, but the way around. So Sander, you're, I think, first now in the list. Any comments, any questions you still want to ask? No, I think uh, I, I really enjoyed the, the, the conversation here. Um, it is good to see that uh, all the noses are going the same direction slowly. And we finally are ready to start saying goodbye to ng modules and when that happens the rest will follow and i think that's a good thing awesome thank you very much for participating pete anything to add <clears throat> uh, i wanted to say in terms of things like ng modules disappearing it's a huge developer experience question right this is not just a technical issue it's really a bigger picture about philosophically like what is angular what is how does angular work for developers and so we can't just jump into any specific technical solution without thinking really carefully about what is the ecosystem like the environment that uh, we want angular developers to be living in and so that needs a lot of thought and discussion with the community as well as um, as well as just like technical discussions internally um, Something which is not particularly related to this discussion today, but um, is compiler related, is that um, we are, as you said, working on the linker. And if you are a library author, then I'd really recommend you to find out about what impact this might have on you and in terms of your libraries and what you will be publishing in the future, uh, because we'd like to get your feedback on on how you think that will affect you. So if you are if you're a library author, then get in touch and have a play with uh, partial compilation and uh, linking. That's a great. I feel being watched somehow. Yep. <laughs> and I, I know Lars as well, and uh, I might have a library or two around as well. So I feel addressed. Yeah, very, very cool. Thanks a lot for that insight as well. And and um, from the Angular community, you're always welcome to have discussions like here on this podium and this forum. I'm super happy to host these kind of things because I, th I really think it improves the bond we have between the community and the team, and uh, which is awesome. So, so that's great. Uh, Michael, any comments, questions? Um, I, I just wanted to point out that we do have a, a, a GitHub issue for tracking this. So there's a bunch of links in there if you want to read more. Um, also writing up like some follow ups and to do's in there. So we've got the one which is Follow on meeting on zone, zoneless, etc. Um, I wasn't sure if there was any follow up that we felt like we needed for this meeting. Um, it sounds like we're going to wait till some of these things land. Um, there's some you know, PRs out there that are coming, and then we'll have to you know, test that, see how that works in the real world. Um, there was a mention of something Juice was working on. Um, I don't have the link to that PR. There was like a a new new thing that it was interesting um so if, if we can get the link to that pr that would be helpful to put in the discussion there there's there's two pending prs for the form stuff i can uh, i can uh, send them to you thanks awesome well thanks a lot uh, as well michael for being here and you're one of the people kicking off this uh discussion so thanks a lot for that uh yost anything to enlighten on to share with us yeah i'm just really excited for an upcoming patch uh, where you'll see the uh, performance improvements and i would also like to invite all of you who uh, experience some kind of a uh, slowdown or whatever to uh, open an issue and uh, report it to us um, because as i said before the one repo is uh, vastly different in terms of performance compared to the next so uh, we can learn from all of uh, the different uh, scenarios there so. Please do open issues if you uh, have problem with performance there. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Joost, and thanks for everything you do for the project and for TypeScript. It's uh, simply amazing and very inspiring to see. So very cool. You're welcome. <laughs>
Um, and last but not least, from the team, Alex, anything you want to share with us or other things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so myself and a couple uh, other Angular team members have been working um, for the past six months or so on the Angular language service, uh, getting it ready for Ivy. Uh, it's feature compatible with the existing one and has a couple cool new um, tricks that it's learned how to do. Uh, you can now use find references between templates and application code. So if you find references in a template expression, it'll show you where in your application code that's declared or vice versa. Um, you, uh, yeah, and it's available right now as an opt-in. So in your extension settings, you can simply enable the IV mode and we'll take care of uh, running NGCC for you and getting your um, language service experience up and running. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we're at the point right now where we need more people to try this out and, and kind of let us know where it works and where it doesn't. And uh, we're hoping to, to bring it to you in 12. That's awesome. Congrats on that effort. That's that's super nice. Sander, you want to chime in on this? Yes, I have a question about that. Um, is there a way I can do some profiling if I have slowdowns there? So I can help I... you with like a, a profile of this is going wrong in VS Code because sometimes I have projects that like take seconds for, for things like the F12 to jump to something. And yeah, absolutely. Um, the language service makes a, a fairly verbose log and that log file includes quite a bit of the information we need to start um, debugging some of those things. And yeah, if you have reproductions of, of cases where like, oh, I noticed when I, you know, I do these three steps, then something slow. That's yeah, awesome. but the problem is it's never reproducible. It's yeah, it's slow, and then you close your editor, you start it back up, and it will not be slow until. Yeah, and then you say, I'm... okay, now I'm going to record it, and it's not slow. Yeah, that's why our, our log file is so helpful because it actually captures some of that that state of you know not just what you were doing that instant, but what was happening in the background. I think it's probably yeah, it... quantum state that if you observe it, it starts to behave differently, Sander. Yeah, I think yeah. so. So we do have an Angular language service channel in the Discord. Uh, Alex is an active member of the Discord. So if you have any issues or questions or want to test it out, go go there. I'm curious to learn, is this something that's going to be landing in WebStorm? So I'm one of the three non-VS Code users in the world. Uh, is this something that comes to other editors too? I'm actually, uh, 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 well, not WebStorm, but Atelier user myself. Uh, and the funny thing is that JetBrains does all of the analysis by themselves. Yeah. Uh, so they are not actively using the uh, Ang Angular uh, language service uh, yeah. in their Yeah, because when I see the new features in language service, I was like, I've been working with this for years. We have this stuff already, but it's not in VS Code. But uh, yeah, yeah, so, so we work directly with them. Um, and so we built kind of part of part of the IV compilation model is the information that we put into TypeScript type declaration files when we build a library or an application. And some of that information is necessary for the compiler to use to depend on that library. Some of that information is only there to power the language service um, right. so that we can understand kind of we can we can we're able to follow things like references um, across components. And so we've been working with JetBrains to actually incorporate that information into their model. So some of the, the features that they have will be getting better or faster as a result of um, kind of synergy between what Angular language service needs and what JetBrains language service needs. That's awesome. I'm, I'm super, super excited to see that. So yeah, for the VS Code users, which is the big majority of the developers out there today, go to the Angular extensions, go to its settings, enable IV mode, Go test it out, and if you find any issues, please uh, let us know. Alex, also thanks to you very much for all your sharing, all your knowledge, and being an active member of the community. Uh, Lars, last up, any any things, any final words, things you want to touch on? Yeah, I want to thank all of you for for joining. It's nice to see uh, many people from even from the Angular team and GG program and the collaborators program, uh, and I want to. Pass on a special thank you to Yoast. Uh, two years ago, I was bored of waiting around for Ivy, so I figured what was exciting, and it was these news APIs we also talked about today, the render component, Mark30, 
and Yoast helped me figure out how to create a full Angular application. It has, I think it has one module, but every component declares it on its own dependencies in an array, like no, no modules needed. That's a, that's a very nice experiment, but yeah, I hope we can like get that into the mainstream framework at some point, something like that. That'd be really yeah, exciting. Cool. Very cool. Cool. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. It was a really, really informative session. I'm going to do a, um, a shameless promotion for the Discord again. And uh, this is where you can find us. We, we have been around for like half a year, and we're reaching about 7,000 members, which is great. Uh, it's not just the member count. We do have a thriving community there. And uh, so it's a very nice place to hang around, ask your questions. All levels are welcome. Various languages are there, spoken languages. Uh, so yeah, everybody feel free to join here. And with that, we're gonna wrap up today. Everybody, I hope you have a great day and we'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you, thank you for much. hosting us. Thanks for hosting Thanks. us, Freedom. <laughs>